All right. Hello, everybody. I think we'll get started here. Um, thanks for joining us today for today's mini conference, Hives of Catalytic Exchanges. Uh, we have an exciting lineup coming up. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Marchand. I'm the Virtual Programs Coordinator here at Griffin Art Projects. And just before we get started here today, I would like to acknowledge that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Mus Musqueam nations, as well as Stolo. And we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. I do recognize as well that we are being joined from uh, people from all over the country today. So if you would care to do a little land acknowledgement or tell us where you're situated uh, in the chat, you're, you're free to do so. I'd also like to just mention that we do have live captioning enabled for today's event. So if you would like the captioning enabled on your end, you can select the CC live transcription button, which is along the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please note that it's not perfectly accurate and it struggles with particularly with place names, people names, but we do hope that it helps with your experience today. And lastly, um, if you are experiencing any technical difficulties with the Zoom interface, we're also live streaming today's events live on Facebook. Um, so you can see our page there or just type in Griffin Art Projects into the Facebook search bar and it should bring you there. Okay. I'll also mention that at, at the conclusion of uh, the center portion of today's events, um, we will be having a Q&A session. So just keep in mind that we are currently in the Zoom's webinar format, so we can't see or hear our audience members. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A uh, dialog box, which you'll notice is separate from the chat. And if you would like to ask your question aloud for that portion of today's events, um, you can just indicate it such in the in the in your question, and we can unmute you for that portion. Um, so without further ado, I'll start introducing today's events. Today's mini conference is presented on the occasion of a two-part series called The Great Exchange, coinciding with Griffin's current exhibition, Teeth Loan and Trust Company Consolidated, the Trelowski Collection, and Toronto-based artist Bill Burns' project, The Goat, the Salt, the Oil. The conference will be presented in three parts, beginning with an artist talk by Bill Burns, which will be followed by a panel discussion featuring Dr. Janice Tim Botos of Art Hive, William Huffman of West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, and Johnny Sapochuk of Value Co-op, which will be moderated by Griffin's adjunct curator, Dr. Karen Tam. Finally, to conclude today's events, we invite you to grab a snack or a drink and join us for another session of Chats and Chews, moderated by Grace Love Aya Collective where we will informally discuss and unpack some of the themes of the conference here today. I will quickly just share in the chat um, the link for Chats and Chews. You'll note that we're actually going to have to switch formats for that. As I mentioned earlier, we're in Zoom's webinar format, but for Chats and Chews, since it's more of an informal hangout, we would like to invite everybody to uh, be able to enable their video and their audio as they would like. Um, so we'll be switched, we'll be logging off of this account or this um, Zoom meeting and, and joining another that you'll have full access for that. Um, so I'll be, I just added the registration link in the chat and I'll also be sharing the kind of live join, join that Zoom meeting at the end of today's events here. So today's slate of virtual events will begin with a keynote artist talk by Griffin's current artist in residence, Bill Burns. During his residency at Griffin Art Projects from December 8th to February 28th, Bill Burns will continue his ongoing research, examining parallel economies, which include the project, The Goat, the Salt, the Oil, a performance series that positions global trade as an art practice. At Griffin, Bill will research a further speculative iteration of this project, activating the site of Vancouver, Vancouver's Harbor and producing a series of short films, this time potentially proposing the trade of Red Snapper for goat's milk, yogurt for honey, organizing a shipment of Nepalese salt for olives or other foodstuffs in Vancouver. The residency includes a photo study of Vancouver's dockyards, trains and freight yards, drawings or pre-documents of potential future trades and short Super 8 film diaries of Bill, of Bill Burns' everyday life in pandemic under the regime of advanced global industrialism. And with that, I would like to hand things over to Griffin's gallery director, Lisa Baldessera. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. Um, and thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you so much to our panelists and to our keynote speaker, uh, Bill Burns. Um, 
I am delighted to introduce Bill. Um, this uh, residency has been a few, I guess just over a year in, in planning and we're just absolutely delighted to have Bill with us for the next three months. Um, Bill has received national and international attention for his artist books, performances, works, performance works, sculpture, drawing, and multiples. He studied under Maury Baden at the University of Victoria and completed his postgraduate work in London at Goldsmiths College under Gerard Hemsworth and John Latham. His work on advanced industrialism, including donkeys, goats, milk, salt, safety gear, and honeybees, has been widely exhibited nationally and internationally including in exhibitions at the Institute of Contemporary Arts London, the Museum of Modern Art New York, KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin, Mendez Wood Gallery in Sao Paulo, 303 Gallery New York and Seoul Museum of Art, as well as the Stidelite Museum in Amsterdam. Bill's work has also been included in many biennials, including the Art and Life Forum at the Havana Biennial in Havana in 2003, the Biennial de Fin de Mundo in Argentina in 2007 and the Quebec City Biennial in 2010, as well as the Biennial of Moving Images in Buenos Aires in 2013, Biennial de Asuncion in Paraguay in 2015, and the Biennial de Curitiba in Brazil in 2017. His most recent notable projects are many, but I will just focus on the Great Donkey Walk in 2018 in Amden, Switzerland, as well as the national tour and international tour of safety gear for small animals which uh, in addition to Gallery 303 and MoMA also in tour, tour to the ICA. His 2002 project, Everything I Could Buy on eBay about malaria, which was shown at the Wellcome Trust in London, England, is considered a seminal work in the area of electronic collecting. Other major solo projects include his bird radio work at KW in Berlin, Love and Affection at Mendez Wood in Sao Paulo and the Great Chorus at the Royal Ontario Museum in 2016. He has published numerous artist books with publishers in Canada, Germany, US, and the UK, Austria, and Denmark. And his most recent titles include a meta list for the Power 100, published by Verlag Mark Petzinger, Vienna in 2018, and Hans Ul Ulrich Obrist, Hear Us, published by YYZ Books in Toronto, and Black Dog Publishing in London, England. In 2016, the Flora and Fauna Information Service was published by London ICA and Dogs and Boats and Airplanes told in the form of Ivan the Terrible in Copenhagen at Space Poetry in 2011. His artist editions are included in collections at Cabinet des Estampes Geneva, Tate Britain, the Museum of Modern Art and Getty Center Los Angeles. Burns is also the artistic director of the Dogs and Boats and Airplanes Experimental Children's Choir. The choir has produced live performances and audio works at festivals in Australia, Argentina, the UK, and Canada. At Griffin during this residency from December 8th to February 28th, three short films and several songs about donkeys, cowboys, truckers, and container ships, he will continue his investigations of alternative economies and the critique of advanced global capitalism. Thank you so much, Bill, for being with us today, and we're really excited to hear about your upcoming work with us. <clears throat> Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Lisa. And uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this project. And uh, and uh, and I, uh, really nice to meet the, the other uh, the other panelists and and Karen as well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing about your projects. Um, so I, I think I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk uh, a little bit, sort of just try and uh, outline a few of my uh, past projects that are related to this, um, what I'm planning to do at the, uh, at the Griffin. And um, I thought I would start by uh, sort of framing a little bit um, my, uh, my interest in economy um, started like uh, 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 with um, well, I, my interest in economy is I think not unusual for an artist. That I think that's uh, especially for conceptual artists. Um, but the w one particular economist um, named uh, Thorsten Veblen is a, a kind of appealing because uh, 
he started to look at, uh, he was looking, at, he was working at the end of the 19th century in Chicago. And he uh, began to notice, he observed a couple of, of unusual aspects of the economy that sort of contradicted the uh, classic Jeffersonian uh, supply and demand, the, the Fordist principles of supply and demand. So um, he came up with two observations. One is that uh, some goods, uh, um, the demand for some goods, special special goods, which are now known as Veblen goods, increases um, as their price increases. So, uh, so that's kind of a direct contradiction of the classic um, supply and demand. And the other thing, which maybe is more particular in this case for me, um, is the idea that there's a deliberate uh, there's, he, he coined the idea, uh, the notion of um, uh, conspicuous consumption, where the uh, where people, wealthy people, uh, deliberately consume uh, uh, wastefully. So it's a kind of deliberate waste of, of resources. Um, and so, uh, and just to give you an example of what is like a Veblen good uh, concept, uh, I I saw Jean. Uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier or someone like him on the on the interview on television um, uh, and he was talking about how he came to price his, his items. Uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier uh, you probably know is a, a fashion designer um, and he worked at his grandfather's fruit stand in Paris and uh, his, his grandfather said Jean-Paul take those pears make a little pyramid there and put a sign on it that says three francs and then put the rest in the box and put a sign on it that says one franc and he said oh, but grandpa it's the same pair and grandpa said um, some people like to pay more <clears throat> so that's uh, I think a good explanation of what how a Veblen good operates um, so another uh, important sort of framing just uh, if you'll permit me, is the uh, my I was working up north in the Yukon uh, at a small school called the Yukon School of Visual Arts, and uh, it's a wonderful place. And I had the opportunity to work uh, to travel with my students to uh, a village by the name of Old Old Crow. It's the most northerly village in in the Yukon, and um, uh, I'm, I, we met with elders there and um, we were talking about, you know, trying to find observations about climate change, kind of direct observations. Um, it was part of a larger science and art project run by uh, the Yukon School of Visual Arts in the Climate Change Center in Saskatoon. And um, my meeting with uh, elders was uh, what, well, twofold. First, the first thing that happened was I was given a gift of caribou meat, quite a large uh, piece of meat, which meant I had a lot of kind of um, cooking to do over the next few days. But it was also like uh, tied me into the kind of uh, notion of being where I was. So uh, kind of positioned me within a kind of uh, part of nature that I wasn't familiar with. Um, Old Crow has 300 people, but every year uh, has a visit visitation of 150 to, uh, to 200,000 uh, uh, caribou. And, um, and uh, the, the birthing uh, area for the caribou is, is north of there on the coastal plains. So the caribou come through uh, both on the way in and on the way out. Um, so, uh, so this was kind of a, a kind of connection to this land um, that I was uh, unfamiliar with. Um, and uh, one of the elders I met with uh, told me about her life and, and she uh, was um, the same age as I am. Um, and she told me all about her, her life until about age of 30. So 
when I was at graduate school, um, Louise was uh, building uh, canoes, um, going like every year, going off into the woods um, in March. Uh, so the, the men would go off into the, the spring camp in, from Old Crow at the end of March. Um, they would build uh, the camp up and they would also build the canoes um, for the return journey. So they would go out by dog sled and then uh, the return would be by canoe. Um, and so the, so this was uh, something that I found really intriguing that this person was, you know, had a similar life to mine in most respects, you know, lived in a, in a house, so I drove a vehicle, uh, has been to Paris and London. Uh, but uh, when she was in her 30s, she was uh, hunting ducks and uh, building canoes and uh, and bringing them back by river. So the, the return journey from um, the spring camp to Old Crow uh, entailed uh, so a few, they would be at the uh, camp for several weeks uh, as the thaw began. The river would uh, then break up. Uh, so then it was passable. The river was passable, but the land was no longer passable uh, by dog sled or anything because it was too soft and, and there was no snow. Um, so the return journey was by a canoe. The canoes would be, the six canoes, two of them would be filled with ducks um, two of them would be filled with dogs. Uh, one of them was with all the all the people, all the members of her family, and uh, and the fifth one was the camping gear. So it was, it was kind of a, a revelation for me, and it started to make make and it it kind of uh, put into position some of my uh, my thoughts about um, our kind of. Uh, the way we might want to have um, relationship with nature, and our, our kind of relationship that we might have <clears throat> with animals, and the kind of uh, cohabitation that we that we kind of I, I think we need to have, and um, <clears throat> with with animals, and also um, with nature. So I'll, maybe I'll show us a few pictures while I'm talking through this. Um, I'm going to share the screen. So Do I have to push on the share button? Yeah, I'm sharing. So I'm just gonna. Uh... So this is a project uh, that uh, Lisa referred to, um, which is uh, <clears throat> which took place in in Switzerland in Amden, Switzerland. And um, I, I walked up the mountain uh, with the donkeys and, um, uh, and on the way up the mountain, I, I, um, I, I bought some, or I, I uh, exchanged some salt. First, I started out with salt from the local mine and um, and then from there, um, I exchanged some salt for apples at the orchard. And at the top of the mountain, I, I exchanged some apples for uh, honey. And then it was Rosh Hashona at the time. So uh, we, um, we ate some, uh, some apples and honey with a pinch of salt at the top of the mountain. Um, so, uh, yeah, so th those are sort of my, uh, uh, that's a project that's kind of dear to my heart. 
And um, <clears throat> yeah. And so there, um, <clears throat> I guess I'd like to just uh, suggest a couple other connections. First of all, I, I have a lot of uh, collaborators I work with here, in this case, with the local farmers um, and the beekeeper. And in Toronto, uh, a recent project with, uh, with farmers and beekeepers um, and a brass band as well. Um, and, um, and I, so I, I'm trying to make these kind of exchanges between different, um, uh, organizations, uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, look at the problems that we have of, of how we can connect with, with animals and nature. So for me that, uh, that connection, um, with trade and animals in nature has a kind of a built-in tension uh, where um, I, my project has this, uh, I'm sort of compelled to do a kind of, uh, you know, recreation of a capitalist um, adventure, which would be to uh, trade a large, make a, make a kind of large scale industrial trade with something like salt or something. And so like this kind of built-in tension between that and trying to be good to um, and have a relationship with animals in nature. So these, uh, I think, are kind of the kind of main tensions of my practice, especially on this project. <clears throat> and I think of them in relationship also to uh, uh, Donna Haraway's uh, kind of propositions, which are uh, that we, uh, live in a in a in a moment which she calls the capital scene rather than the anthropocene and that um, is a is a moment that started maybe around 1000 AD um, with trade from uh, the Indian Ocean to Africa Asia European trade at that point so that's where she kind of points our our kind of particular moment historically in terms of our relationship with nature and, and planet. Um, and then her aspirational uh, idea, which is that she aspires to the, what she calls the Thulacine, um, whereas, which is more of a cohabitation concept so that we would be able to cohabitate with, with nature and with, uh, with animals. So those, um, are sort of the kind of large rubric that I'm trying to work with. And then these are pictures I'm showing you are, are what I call uh, pre-documents um, pre and sometimes they're documents, but they're part of my project about what um, I, I aspire to, both in terms of my relations with animals and nature and, and also with you know, what I want to do with this particular project around trade and economy. And, um, yeah, so, um, those are sort of, uh, the sort of broad strokes of this project, but I, maybe I will, um, uh, try and show, uh, a video here of my, uh, recent performance in Toronto. See what I can find here. Um, so, um, I hope this is working. It doesn't seem to be working.
Science and Holdings Limited, Tesla Inc., and Facebook Incorporation. Spencer Salt provides nearly all the salt used in Canadian road maintenance for winter. All that salt in the road, all mine. Help. Okay, so, so those are, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, what I would, um, uh, uh, I commissioned those Georgian chanters who are, made, who are called the Chahari, uh, Machari, and um, uh, Alan Gasser was the uh, who uh, wrote the the um, scripted the the uh, Georgian chant, and um, the commission was to uh, build the Georgian chant out of the the one hundred uh, Fortune one hundred uh, companies, the largest uh, companies in the world. So um, those are kind of kind of a way of conflating my kind of. Uh, interests and projects. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's um, that's a start. And then I'll, maybe I'll just end with one more uh, small video uh, that shows the same project just to give you a kind of sense of that. But I, I guess here in Vancouver, I should just mention what I plan to do. I have, uh, I have some oil. Uh, some olive oil arriving from um, Palestinian territories um, here soon, I hope. And um, uh, so I would like to be trading some of that um, material. Um, like I said, my my project um, with the kind of reenactment of, of like large global trading transactions, um, I that strategy, I, I feel a kind of uh, tension around that strategy because of my, you know, that the kind of idea of cohabitating with with nature, um, it seems in kind of contradiction of, of that proposition. So, um, so that's one of the kind of things I'm, I'm sort of working on. But I think the, uh, my trading of smaller sets of goods like I did in Switzerland, where I traded some salt from the mine for apples, and then I traded some apples for honey at the beekeepers. And then uh, with the proceeds, uh, there was surplus value at the top of the mountain, and we were able to have um, some apples and salt and honey. Um, so those are maybe, uh, these kind of transactions might be the, my operating mode here in Vancouver. And so I am hoping to trade some of the oil for for um, for some uh, fish or whatever I can uh, find. Also, honey uh, is of interest. So if anyone's out there, um, that would be of interest to me. Um, and uh, um, and I am, I, I'm working on some Super 8 films. Um, I have commissioned my, uh, this, in addition to the uh, 100 corporations in the world, uh, Georgian Chant by Alan Gasser and Machari. Um, I have uh, uh, commissioned also my my nephews to do a couple of uh, songs about goats and and donkeys, and uh, and they're quite uh, charming and wonderful songs. So uh, I hope uh, to be able to present some of those in future. Um, and I, I so. Uh, so those are my uh, my things, and I'll, I'll just uh, I'll end this with one minute uh, video here um, of uh, let me see what we have here.
Why don't you reshare your screen with, with us, Bill? Oh, okay. Okay. Where am I? Here I am. Share screen. So we're sharing now? Yep, looks good. Okay, thanks. Can you see me again? So, uh, uh, so thanks very much. I just uh, maybe um, want to uh, position my work with with animals, also in terms of uh, like a kind of negotiation. Um, I would say uh, uh, that I I think of this uh, these these kind of trades uh, also as a kind of interspecies project and um so my work with with goats and donkeys and sometimes dogs um is something that i consider to be a kind of relationship uh of communication and negotiation um and i think that there's there's a lot of uh you know again some uh problematic areas around agency and things like that but i also think it's our one of our one of the hopes that we have of of kind of uh, how we can um, keep the world uh, from falling apart is to reworld and to consider those kind of cooperation as something as a communication between species. So uh, for me, that's uh, kind of one of my strategies and hopes for how to cohabitate. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, yeah. That's it for me. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, those events look as participatory as they are lively. It looks like a really fun time uh, to be involved with those. I uh, appreciate taking a look at your practice and pretty excited to see what, what you end up doing during your time of residence here at Griffin as well. Uh, I would like to remind everybody that if you would like to ask Bill any questions, he'll also be around for the Q&A portion of today's conference. That'll be at the conclusion of the panel discussion, which will be happening soon here. Um, so again, you can input your questions at any point throughout today's events in the Q&A dialogue box, and we'll circle back to them afterwards. Um, so maybe it's a good time to shift gears uh, to that panel discussion. Um, the Hives of Catalytic Exchanges panel uh, so this discussion will explore alternative economics and art that provide models for reciprocal engagement, art making, and mutual aid that nurture community and build solidarity. From creative cooperatives to community art studios to mutual aid groups that support and care for their members and peers, these alternatives to the traditional notion of art and labor help sustain the livelihood of artists and cultural workers through the provision of income streams and the sharing of resources, skills, and knowledge. Highs of Catalytic Exchanges was conceived and will be moderated by Griffin's adjunct curator, Dr. Karen Tam. Karen Tam is an artist whose research focuses on the various forms of construction and constructions of imagination of cultures and communities. Through her installation work in which she recreates spaces of Chinese restaurants, karaoke lounges, opium dens, curio shops, and other sites of cultural encounters. Since 2000, she has exhibited her work and participated in residencies in North America, Europe, and China, including the Deutsche Borse Residency at the Frankfurter Kunstverein, 
I definitely mispronounced that one, um, but I'll try, try my best. Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal and CUU Art Foundation. She was a finalist for the Prix Louis Contois in 2017 from the Contemporary Art Galleries Association and the Ville de Montréal. A finalist for the Prix en Art Actuel from the Musée des Beaux-Arts de Québec in 2016 and long listed for the Sobe Art Award in 2016 and 2010. Tam lives and works in Montreal and holds an MFA in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a PhD in cultural studies from Goldsmiths University of London. Karen, thanks so much for joining us today for what promises to be an engaging panel discussion. I'll pass things over to you to introduce the panel a little bit more as well as the panelists. Thanks, Nathaniel. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'd like to, while we meet today virtually, I just wanted to take a moment to um, recognize and acknowledge that I'm here today on Jojega, Montreal, um, a site of meeting exchange for many First Nations, including the Ganya Kahaga, Huron, Wendat, Abenaki, and Anishinaabeg peoples. Um, on whose ancestral um, and ceded ancestral land I am grateful to live and work on as a racialized um, non-Indigenous guest. Um, I wanted to thank Bill as well for a fascinating presentation on your current project, uh, for sharing your research and engagement in trade, exchange, economy, food production, um, animal care and labor. Um, and uh, to think about, you know, the reenactment of what you said, the reenactment of large global trade transactions, but on a individual local level. So um, I'm really looking forward to your next few weeks uh, or month during your residency. Um, and um, so Bill's practice as a kind of circular economy engagement with local communities brings us to the Hives of Catalytic Exchanges panel, which will explore, um, as uh, Nathaniel mentioned, alternative economies in art. Um, these are models that are unique in their focus on the arts and artists of the community and have shifted conversations on um, arts and cultural practice um, and labor. From the community art hives that are embedded within neighborhoods and on whose principles of learning through spontaneous or unprogrammed art making, ties are strengthened between community members through a shared space. In both the spaces of art hives and the uh, Kinite Studios life experiences are brought into cooperative learning environments with the idea of learning together, of learning in solidarity with communities. As um, the oldest community art studio cooperative in Canada, Kinite Studios continues to develop, produce, distribute, and promote Inuit art nationally and internationally. As an example of a shared economy and using a co-op model to establish and develop a business enterprise locally owned and controlled within its community, it provides an income stream for the artists and their families. Um, and then another example of new methods of sustaining the livelihood of artists and cultural workers is Vancouver's value co-op, which prioritizes and subverts uh, a capitalist model of business, bringing up important conversations on art and labor of empowering artists and cultural workers and, and of transforming labor practices um, in Vancouver and BC wide. Uh, to me, organizations such as Art Hives Knight Studios Value Co-op feel more like hives building structures of solidarity and show how community is fostered through mutual care, um, as well as the acts of sharing, making, and doing together. So um, as Nathaniel mentioned, following our panelists' presentations, we'll have a Q&A session, um, after which we'll have a short tenant break to get drinks and snacks before ending today's mini conference with the chat and choose informal conversation between you, our audience, and moderated by Grace Law of Edmonton-based AYA Collective. So to begin, our first, um, our first speaker, um, is Dr. Janice Tim Botos, um, who is uh, a former physical therapist, a board certified art therapist and an associate professor in the Faculty of Fine Arts at Concordia University in Montreal. Tim Botos is the founder and director of the Art Hives Network Initiative, which links 227 art hives worldwide. She promotes art-based social inclusion through the development of 
neighborhood and institutional third spaces of mutual care for all ages, along with specialized studios for groups requiring more support to regain their footing in society. Her research investigates public practice therapies and the art hive as a therapeutic anchor for individuals, families, and communities. She currently serves as the PI for FLQS Engaged Living Lab Creatif, located in the local mall, and is serving as a co-director of Concordia's Design, Arts, Culture, and Community of Next Generation Cities Institute. Um, and Jan, uh, Dr. Janice um, Timbotos will be talking about the Art Hives Network Initiative, which is a community art studio that welcomes everyone as an artist, from a neighborhood pop up in a park or local library to a space in the university, gallery, and museum at its heart. And Art Hive is about inclusion, respect, and learning new skills from each other. It's a welcoming place to talk, make art, and build community. Um, and over to you, Janice. Thank you so much, Karen. It's a delight to be here. And I want to thank Nathaniel um, for the organization, as well as Bill. What a wonderful project. Oh, well, wonderful, many projects, but what a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. I uh, join Karen as well um, on uh, uh, Kanadi uh, Hoga uh, territory and unceded land of um, the Mohawk people. So I'm gonna begin my PowerPoint sharing here and continue to talk a little bit about art hives um, as well as uh, uh, talk to you about some historical ways in which uh, uh, we get to where we are uh, with this work. Great, all right. It's always nice when we can uh, get to where we wanna be. All right, um, I'm gonna start my talk um, uh, with our, my beginning of this work um, in 1994, working with uh, Healthcare for the Homeless in um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And of course, New Mexico is an amazingly um, diverse indigenous uh, territory uh, that is the home of uh, 19 Pueblos. Uh, three Apache tribes and uh, Navajo Nation. So it's an incredibly diverse um, place to uh, have begun this work, which is really about uh, the meeting place of people from very different backgrounds. And indeed uh, the, the work that I did there um, with the people that were there uh, really was incredibly um, uh, filled with many, many lessons. I'm gonna share with you just a few. Um, so here's where I started out. Um, I, I had been a physical therapist, had been working a lot with uh, children and their families, and um, had decided that I didn't want to be a clinician anymore. I really wanted to join uh, with other people in trying to figure out some of the bigger uh, wicked problems uh, that caused uh, children not to actually have places to live in order to be able to do the work that I had learned how to do to be a physical therapist. Um, it seemed like it needed a much bigger context. So, and I was also having my own children. And so I wanted to include them in the type of work I was doing. So I, I did a, a master's degree in art therapy, which was a very wonderful degree. Um, it was a lot of fun and it uh, was very expansive. Uh, the teachers I had were incredible. Uh, but I had been working with healthcare for the homeless and, um, and decided that uh, I would offer up an idea um, and get together with people that were working um, to bring economic development to people who were living homeless in, in Albuquerque, which had become quite a big problem and had increasingly became a problem as we gentrified uh, the city. So, um, who showed up at these meetings were groups of um, young mothers uh, living homeless, as well as older uh, adults that um, had been surviving on the streets uh, who were artists. And we um, began to talk together and uh, came up with this project called Art Street. 
So this is one of my lessons right here. This is my daughter and I um, working with Manuel Guterres, who's an incredible street artist. And um, I realized that my daughter would have never met him unless I um, had worked together with the artist to find a meeting place. And so the meeting place uh, expanded into all kinds of different ways. But another incredible lesson that I think came into uh, the art hive movement was the idea that we can just share what we already know with each other. We don't need to be taught, and um, uh, but we do need places where we can gather. We do need places that are called, I call public home places. It's, it was not a new name. Um, I didn't come up with it. It was more about uh, we need places, uh, social infrastructure within communities where uh, people from different backgrounds, people who don't have homes um, can meet and, um, and put all their skills together. Uh, within a couple of years, I think it was about a six uh, year, seven year period, um, we decided that um, the artists had, had been doing incredible work and we didn't really have a place for a gallery. So there was a whole other project that spun off uh, from this group in, that was called Off Center Arts. And we were able to then sell art. So the artists made um, uh, either 80 to 100%, whatever it is uh, that they needed of their artwork was sold uh, to be able to um, support them into housing basically. Uh, it was a great place to develop skills, um, sharing skills with each other, but also we had equipment to be able to frame the work and, and to display it. So all this led to um, moving to Canada um, uh, a number of years later, and then being offered a job at Concordia University. So this is what I came and said that I was going to do. And, I didn't know how hard it was going to be, but I really wanted to expand on this idea of uh, how can we uh, create small networks uh, where other people are doing this work so that many more uh, social infrastructures could be developed that could hold what's called third space, what's between home and work and uh, between each other, where this, it's a whole liminal space that gets uh, activated so that new ideas can come forward. And so we started a little space uh, through Concordia University called La Rouche uh, Da Art, and, and that became um, the Art Hive movement after uh, several years of working together. So I do, um, I am a professor at Concordia University, and um, as many of us know, the university has incredible resources, and they're always uh, trying to solve problems. So this became one uh, convincing idea about how can we um, join together with other people and practice a world that we want to live in. And this, of course, is pre-pandemic. Um, you can imagine that our projects uh, truly across the world closed because of the pandemic and we had to create all new ways of working. But this is the essence of the work and, and the, the energy of it is, I think, really shown in, the, in this uh, slide here. Uh, the other big piece to the work is that we use uh, recycled materials. Uh, we don't buy much. Uh, we ask for people to donate materials, and this is a very neat version of our household creative reuse depot called the Honey Pot. It was in the basement of Larushda before we had to move uh, from that setting, and we were there almost 10 years. And it was, it was an incredible place to house the work, um, which just uh, kind of exploded into a lot of other places um, and still is growing. It, it seems to have um, a cascading effect and people uh, that really re resonate with it do uh, tend to start their own art hives. It also serves as a community classroom, which we didn't have at Concordia. So LaRouche Da became a first example of a community art studio that could also serve students to learn about how to walk and live and interact with people in particular communities. We also had an incredible backyard that became a garden. Uh, it was developed into a garden over the 10 years we were there. 
and um, we would host a lot of um, institutes uh, uh, there to teach uh, community members to share how it is that we do this work and how it can be done with very uh, small amounts of money and a lot of work. Uh, but um, yeah, this is one of our examples of our summer institutes. So the vision of this work is that well, there should be an art hive in every neighborhood across Canada and, um, and beyond. And there have been many art hives developed in Montreal, especially. Uh, this is one, Le Milieu, um, started by um, a colleague of mine who now runs the network, uh, Rachel Cheney. And it is uh, one of the co-ops. Uh, a lot of the art hives have different models of uh, social economy. And this is one of the, the co-ops that's very popular in Montreal. So here's our map. Um, if you go onto our website, you'll see this. We, we now have 229 art hives that are linked together. Some of them are in different states of uh, online activities and um, closed and reopening. We have many, many art hives that are now reopening. We have weekly um, community of practice meetings where people from all over the world talk about uh, what's going on in their art hive and, and what help they may need. Um, and so I wanted to, since history seemed to be um, privileged in this uh, panel, I decided to, to take advantage of that because I love uh, the history of public home place. And, um, and I love this, um, this quote that says, any historic place once protected and interpreted uh, potentially has the power to serve as a lookout for future generations who are trying to plan the future, having to come to terms with the past. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of that right now, especially in, in honor of indigenous communities, uh, looking back at what has happened and all that we've uh, lost and, um, and all that we can gain by returning and reconnecting uh, with the, the roots of the land that we live on, live and work on. But this was a curious thing about LaRouche Da. There was actually a LaRouche um, before we moved into St. Henry. Uh, we're st there's still a little bit of a mystery of um, when this article was written, but uh, this was an economic, a social economic project of women, single women uh, who were unemployed, who came together making things to sell and uh, very successfully so. So I wanna go back a little bit further and give you, because um, I think it ends in an important message uh, that I wanted to, to really send to you today um, of how people from different economic backgrounds have gotten together and made big decisions about creating a social, a social infrastructure for people who have so little um, to be able to support them in doing what they know how to do best. And so here's Jane Adams. Many of you may have know this history. Uh, this is a US history. I am from the US and it's part of uh, my culture and part of the culture in Canada to provide spaces for people who don't have their own spaces. And as a matter of fact, in, and I think in Quebec especially so, um, the infrastructure of social housing is well established um, and it has a particular history of public home place that I would love to talk to you about, but I chose to do this one to, to, uh, today. So Jane Adams uh, and her friend Ellen were very wealthy women who really didn't have much to do and they decided to create and build this uh, 13 building complex for uh, the numerous people that were moving um, as immigrants into the city. And there was very little um, infrastructure set up for them uh, to be able to survive well. I mean, like basic plumbing and um, trash removal, things like this did not exist. There were no playgrounds, there were no schools. And so this was one place um, that kids could come and, um, and adults uh, as well and practice uh, what it is that, um, uh, that they were introduced to and or brought to the, uh, the, uh, the space itself. Uh, these were really important spaces and still are. 
So um, Jane Adams had several students uh, that went on to do other things. And I'm bringing you in a Canadian example of, Je of Jessie Luther, who while she did um, come up from the East Coast um, of the US, she uh, worked along the uh, border, uh, the, the um, uh, the, nor uh, the northern uh, top tip of uh, Newfoundland into Labrador. And she was hired by Dr. Grenfell, who um, uh, invited her to come because she did have this knowledge uh, from the settlement house movement in Chicago that she, she had uh, started and, and she directed the, the museum there. Um, so she came up um, influenced with the arts and crafts movement and really did create an amazing network of, um, of spaces uh, throughout uh, that region to, um, pro to provide opportunities for people, especially during the winter, um, to make crafts uh, in order to survive the winter when the fishing and other um, modes of work was not available. So here, uh, some of our weaving projects, um, there was every kind of craft um, that people were interested in making. They did, this is basket making, that's Jesse Luther on the, on the right there. Um, the you know, studios were set up in different villages. Uh, St. Anthony's was one of the, the major sites that a lot of the ideas and materials moved in and out of. Um, and then there was this incredible network of volunteers. There were at one point like 5,000 uh, university students and uh, staff members uh, uh, would come and bring materials and then take materials back. There was, you know, of course, Dr. Grenfell was very involved with the whole medical team, um, but these, where, these um, art, pieces were sold uh, throughout the US, especially in the north and the northern uh, cities of the US. And it was a social economy. Uh, what people needed most was clothing. Uh, they didn't really need money as much as they needed materials and supplies themselves because they were quite isolated. So um, there was an exchange. There was always exchanges going on. People, women, uh, men working on on projects and then and then handing them in for uh, clothing and other things that they needed. Karen, please tell me too if I'm I, I'm going as fast as I can, but I want to make sure I don't take too much time. Sure, sure. You've got five minutes. Okay, great. Um, and so another student of uh, of the Hall House, uh, where Jane Adams and Ellen Starr's Settlement House uh, movement began. Uh, what, this woman's name was Lugina Burns Hope. Uh, she married John Hope, um, and they uh, they moved to Morehouse College in order for um, uh, John Hope to. He was the president, uh, the new president of the of the college. And one of the things right away, because Lugina Burns Hope was an artist and uh, she had studied with uh, Jane Adams, what she realized was that. Um, the university, you can see, <clears throat> this is her uh, community after she moved into the, the president's home there up on the hill, um, did not have the things that um, they were able to successfully obtain for people up north. And she realized that these, uh, this, the neighborhood that was surrounding um, the college was incredibly poor and incredibly lacking in um, particular important things, uh, basic uh, lighting systems for, for the streets and, um, and, all, and all the, the different infrastructure that cities need to have in, in order to have healthy uh, communities. Uh, what was there, however, was incredible people and the arts uh, were very much alive. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, the places in which the uh, the blues, you know, the jazz blues um, uh, started. Um, I just wanted to check to give you the name of. So this was West Atlanta, and this is Beaver Slide, um, uh, where where she set set out to begin her work as the president 
uh, president's wife, uh, but also she was she was a, pretty much a sociologist and she started right away teaching and using uh, public practice to be able to identify the needs in the different uh, black areas of Atlanta that really required some support. Uh, in every single one of the neighborhoods, there were people that were willing to take on the role of a public home place. And so very soon each of those um, neighborhoods had um, what was called neighborhood houses and, and a union was created. Now this is really significant because um, Jane Addams Project up north, uh, one of the things that, that didn't happen there was the leadership of the actual um, place was not shared with the people. So when the funding was um, in jeopardy, things fell apart. In the neighborhood union, while it did have a period of time where it was the strongest, these small networked uh, spaces of leaders in every single neighborhood, uh, it became a much stronger uh, connective uh, space, spaces, uh, an area. And, um, and the most important thing about this was not only that it was serving in the moments in which uh, it was needed uh, when Lugina Burns Hope was there, but um, it continued on. Um, after the, um, uh, well, we, you know, we're moving into the Great Depression here, so I'm, I'll continue my story after, after this particular piece. But the, the so the Great uh, Depression came and a whole other movement was set up, um, which was called the Federal Art Projects. And it put artists to work, basically, you know, doing incredible things. They had never been had an opportunity to be paid for their labors uh, in this kind of a way ever before. Um, and it also, there was 100 community art studios that, that came, that, that developed out of this, that a lot of people don't know about this history, but we use this to build on to. Um, so, so going back south again, um, yes, the, this, the WPA had happened, um, the public housing was, was starting to come alive and these small networked spaces be, so morphed into what was called citizenship schools. So in, this, is, this history is not always acknowledged when we talk about the civil rights movement, but truly it was the women that uh, had these small spaces that were linked together that allowed this movement to rise up when needed. Um, so I, just to kind of emphasize the fact that um, it may look like people are sitting around and playing with art materials, but these are these network spaces create um, create these these healthy environments in which people can actually um, discover and 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 continue to work together um, to be able to create bigger um, changes to happen. So these movements for change have different aspects. Um, you know, art plays a role. The artists minute, are I'm sorry. The one minute left. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the opportunities for skill share and, and sharing the economy. So back to Montreal, uh, we're working with um, within malls now that we see as potential for a whole network and set, uh, system that can connect, especially older adults um, to their communities. This is the art hive within the Cavendish Mall. They were just coming back in the last semester, coming back alive again um, be, uh, with our masks. And so anyway, uh, the point I'd like to make is to change everything. We need everyone, but we need places for people to meet um, to be able to make this happen. And just a, a call out and thank you to our uh, amazing sponsors. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you more and to hearing the other uh, panelists. And it's, um, yeah, it's really nice to be able to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, for a fascinating presentation. I'm sorry I had to cut you off because I was like, no oh, I want to hear more. <laughs> um, so going, um, 
Next, we'll have uh, William Hoffman as our second panelist. He is an arts administrator, curator, educator, and writer currently with West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, who divides his time between the Kenite Ken and Toronto operations. Hoffman is also a, an occasional instructor with University of Toronto, Toronto School of Art and Visual Arts Mississauga. His recent curatorial work includes several national and international traveling exhibitions. And today he'll be talking about Kenite Studios and West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative. Over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. And this has been such a thrill. It's a, you know hearing everybody um, talking about what they're up to. And I'm so excited to be in this company. And hopefully I will do a good job of telling you about what I'm doing. And I, I'm not going to get into a, a heavy introduction at the moment. I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen and walk you through just eight minutes of video. And we produce these in partnership with the Kane High Commission in London. And they're meant to talk about various um, areas over the history of the organization. And I think it's a really, really good introduction uh, to the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative, Kenite Studios, and, um, and the 62 years that we've been in operation. And then I'll, I'll um, you know, pedal back and, and we'll do a quick overview of the organization uh, with some slides that I've got for you. So I'm gonna share my screen, we'll share sound. And you should see a Culture Canada logo. And I'm just going to play these videos for you. There's eight of them in a series that we produced and they're only one minute each. They weren't for social media, but again, meant to give you uh, a, a very brief overview um, of, of the organization. <laughs> For more than six decades, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has made possible the revered Inuit art of Kinite, formerly known as Cape Dorset, in the territory of Nunavut. A tiny hamlet located in the Canadian Arctic, Kinite has been home to four celebrated generations of Inuit artists. Initially a program of the Canadian federal government designed to create economy in the region, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has grown into one of the most important fine art studios in the country. From its early foundational years under the guidance of James Houston to the mature and sophisticated social enterprise of today, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has always remained a community-owned and Inuit-led organization. The West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative continues to play a crucial role in supporting Inuit artistic practice, bringing this unique expression to the world. That was very Oh, a, a sort of a high level overview. And this will give you a, a, an indication of some of the initiatives outside of what um, we understand or what we expect of the, of the uh, WBEC, um, some of the little known projects that we've been up to over the last, again, 62 years. <laughs> Kingate Studios of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has produced many iconic Inuit creations. Its drawing, printmaking, and sculpture have defined excellence in the genre. The studio's rich history also includes two lesser known but equally unique endeavors. Active in the late 1960s, a textile program at Kinite Studios adapted drawings and prints into patterned fabric for apparel and household use. And in 1977, Kinite Press was launched, and in that year, it would create the Inuit world. 26 pages of text accompanies an original print by the legendary Kananganak Pudigut. Each edition was hand printed on a typography press in Kinite. Resourceful, experimental, and always with a few surprises, the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative's legacy of innovation in Inuit art lives on. And this, this piece highlights Kanoyak Ashavak, who is arguably one of our most important uh, artists. And, um, and I'll play that for you. <laughs> A master artist, cultural ambassador, and mentor, Kanoyak Ashavak was one of the most renowned members of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative. During her lifetime, she created thousands of drawings, prints, and the occasional sculpture, with several of her images becoming some of the most recognizable in Canadian art history. Inspired by Arctic wildlife, Kanoyak's depictions of owls, birds, foxes, and mythological creatures provide us with a glimpse through her unique artistic lens. In addition to her many awards, honors, and international exhibitions recognizing her contribution to Canadian art, Kanoyuak's work adorns stamps and currency, and has even found its way into architecture and public spaces. Since her death in 2013, the work of Kanoyuak Ashavak continues to fascinate global audiences 
and even today, she remains on the forefront of Canadian Inuit creative expression. And it's worth noting before I go into the next one that um, Kanoyuak, who certainly is no longer with us, um, we still have a robust relationship with the estate. In fact, we have a robust relationship with each of the estates of each of our artists who are no, no longer with us. In the case of Kanoyuak, you saw several contemporary images of exhibitions and uh, projects, uh, re reproductions of her work in various circumstances. That's a, a part of the relationship that we maintain with the artist's family. This is uh, this gives you a sense of some of our international initiatives looking beyond Canada. From its beginnings, the Inuit art of Kinite has captured the curiosity of art enthusiasts globally and is frequently featured as an iconic face of Canadian art abroad. West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative actively promotes the creative practices of its member artists internationally. Some recent examples include the traveling exhibition at Kunitini, featuring work by Pitsulaka Shuna, Napchi Pudigut, and Annie Pudigut, the show captivated audiences across America. And posthumously, in 2017, Kananganak Pudigut became the first Inuit artist to participate in the prestigious Biennale de Venezia. In early 2020, the enchanting and provocative work of Shuganaya Shuna was showcased in her first European solo exhibition at the Center for Contemporary Arts in Glasgow. Kinite artists and their unique creative expressions continue to inspire gallery goers and art patrons around the world. Gives you a sense of how active we are on, on uh, international fronts. And part of our job is really to, to um, deal with a lot of the logistics and, and communications, project management, all of those things as they relate to those projects. It gives you a bit of a sense of, of our relationship to the commercial world, which really is the core of what we do, because selling art is um, a major stream of revenue for the, for the organization. You'll see in the org chart where that situates itself, but this gives you an illustrated overview. Artwork created by member artists of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative is both a cultural touchstone and a significant economic driver. Art making in Kinite has been a livelihood for generations of Inuit artists. The West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative works to ensure that this important creative expression is available to collectors at galleries around the world, as well as at many international art fairs. The art of Kinite is also a popular inspiration for a range of publications and merchandise. The West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative has developed creative partnerships that result in many large-scale commissions and collaborations, which often become permanent fixtures in luxury retail environments. Kinite's prints, drawings, and sculptures are highly desirable, and their enduring appeal means that the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative's member creators continue to receive an important economic benefit from their artistry. And this is a little bit off topic, but I'm going to show it anyway. It's um, it's a, the relationship this work has to to these current discussions about environmental change, climate change. The Inuit artists of Kinite have frequently looked to the surrounding tundra and its environment for creative inspiration. From the very first generation to those practicing today, the member artists of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative use art to depict, celebrate, analyze, and reflect on the changing state of their Arctic. The region's unique flora and fauna, which in turn provide the Inuit people vital provisions for both land and sea, can be attributed to a unique ecosystem with dramatic seasonal changes. The celebrated drawings, prints, and sculptures from Kinite illustrate an ecological history and are a vital record of environmental evolution. Through careful observation and generations of traditional knowledge sharing, the Inuit people of Kinite are both the caretakers and documentarians of a vast and complex natural world. This will give you a sense in the first person, um, uh, some of our, 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 our uh, staff and, and printmakers talking about what they do at the studios. <laughs> My name is I'm a printmaker uh, for the artists in King I like to work involved with the artists for one day coming in and explain them why we're going to start bringing their artwork. My name is Ashuna Ashuna. I'm from King Night. I've been a stone cut printmaker for the past eight years now. When you're cutting, it's a, a little bit of 
labor-intensive work. I started working with West Baptist and Co-op uh, in 2011. I really enjoy uh, buying carvings uh, from local people and I enjoy working with my fellow peoples. And the final one, which kind of wraps everything up, future of Inuit art. Although the Inuit art of Kinite today is quite different from its early beginnings, the member artists of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative continue to be inspired by their predecessors. The impact of their lineage on the region's female creators is particularly profound. Drawing on the pioneering influence of their forebearers, the women artists of Kinite are constantly redefining the conventions of Inuit art, using new and innovative forms of expression. Today, we can see contemporary perspectives on tradition, unusual depictions of the surrounding landscape and its local wildlife, slices of 21st century Arctic living, or subjects drawn from pure fantasy. The women artists of the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative ensure that the Inuit art of Kinite remains a lasting and iconic cultural voice one that continues to capture imaginations the world over. I'm just gonna quickly stop this and switch over to the slides. And, and Karen, how am I doing for time? Sorry, you're doing great. There's, you have 10 okay. minutes. I'm just gonna, oh, perfect. I can, I can get through this for sure. And let me go to, There we go. I'm hoping you're getting a full screen now with the image. So once again, thanks again for, for um, uh, the invitation to participate. It's, it's an area, I mean, the forefronting part of our organization really is the art. And so people know us for the, or the artists, for the prints, drawings, and sculpture. But I do think that the organization, the West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative, is as interesting structurally and from a historic point of view um, as the work that it creates. And um, I've been working with the organization for about eight years. And in that time, I have spent an enormous amount of time in the Canadian Arctic, more more so than I thought as an arts administrator, largely trained in downtown Toronto. I didn't realize that I would be dealing with polar bears as often as I as I am these days. And, um, and it, it's interesting because the time that I've spent there, it's important. Because you know, one can certainly surmise, and one can can you know read about, and one can see the the, the documentation. But really, being in the studios, and we'll see images of of Kenite Studios, and understanding not only you know how talented and uh, amazingly amazingly talented these artists are, but also um, how challenging it is to be an artist in the Arctic. It's challenging to live in the Arctic, um, certainly, let alone being an artist. So the support that we provide uh, through through the um, for Kenite Studios. Studios and through the West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative is hugely important in enabling artists to, to do what they do. And for the last 62 years, we've been doing that. And it was mentioned in one of the earlier videos. Um, this is probably one of the, the earliest examples, if not the earliest example, of a social enterprise in Canada. And imagine that this was happening in the Canadian Arctic in a, in a population. Right now, the population of Cape Dorset is 1,400. It's still a very, very small space. And just to give you a sense, that's North Vancouver and there's Cape Dorset. You see Toronto down there. So I have one hell of a commute between Toronto and Cape Dorset uh, when, when I'm able to travel. And I will be, I haven't been to Cape Dorset in quite some time since the pandemic. I will start traveling again in, in January. That gives you a sense landing. And the community is really on either side of the, of the runway. Um, it's a very, very modest place. That's generally the 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 um, the type of plane that you would take into into Cape Dorset. Sometimes they're even smaller. Um, the critical thing about Cape Dorset is it is generally, largely, almost entirely um, fly-in. So in fact, everything that goes to the community, people and supplies, uh, medicine, mail, all of that is uh, on one of these planes. And in fact, when you look at this plane, you assume that, that it's filled with people. Well, in fact, perhaps the last four windows are people. The rest of that is cargo. And you imagine how precarious that kind of a supply chain is. And, and that's how we get all of our supplies um, and how we export the work from Cape Dorset to our offices in Toronto for distribution uh, internationally. It's a shot of Cape Dorset what it used to be, shot of Cape Dorset now, not a whole lot of difference. You can't really grow a city um, in, exponentially in the North. I mean, building is very specific. 
and we saw this image. This is the, the uh, shot of what the studios used to look like, very modest. And we had those for some time. They grew a little bit, but certainly um, what happened in 2019 is we created the Kanoyuak Cultural Center and Print Shop. And this is now our new offices and our new uh, printing facility. Uh, and, and drawing studio. The sculptors who, who use stone as their medium, they usually sculpt outside because it's very, very toxic. And we haven't quite figured out a way to uh, install a ventilation system. So all, all throughout the year, even in minus 50, you'll see the artists uh, carving outside. I'm just gonna run through the images of the cultural center. One of the, the feedback, one of the elements of the feedback that we got from our board of directors was they wanted a facility that could be anywhere in the world, not just in Cape Dorset. And so we looked at models of exhibition spaces, we looked at models of studios and, and put together something that I think is probably a world-class facility um, in, in Cape Dorset, Nunavut in the Canadian Arctic. This just is, a, I think, an important thing to understand. It's, it's our organizational chart. And um, just to give you a quick overview of how the organization works like other co-ops, but ours has a little bit of a difference because of the, the art arm. Um, so you see our membership is really the important part. They're, they own the organization and it's a $5 lifetime membership. And um, about, I would say most of the adult population of Cape Doris, you see the figure from 2019, it's a little bit larger now. Beneath that is the board of directors that manages the organization on a, week to week basis. And um, that board of directors is 100% Inuit, as are our committees of the board. Um, and in, embedded in those committees is the arts committee. So you can imagine that in addition to executive credit and others, you know, arts is really an important part of the discussions that go on at the board level. The general manager, who is the person that I directly report to, and then you see where I am on the one arm, which is the producer and arts division. It's interesting to know that on the other side, which is consumer and retail and fuel, um, those are, are really the robust parts of the organization. They're essential services in Cape Doris. So our, our budget is probably about a $14 million budget annually, of which the other side where I'm located is about 3 million of that is art sales. And you can see that um, we work very closely with the artists in Cape Dorset. Um, and you can see the role and responsibility that I have, you know, based mostly in the Toronto office is all kinds of things, distribution, advocacy, marketing, um, all of those things that, that need to happen in order to, to stimulate market interest in, in the work. And again, we go back to Lot, we do lots of exhibitions, lots of special projects. We do lots of outreach, lots of communications, but really the core of what we do is generate revenue for the artists and generate revenue uh, by extension for the community. Our members receive a, a dividend at the end of each year. So we function as a not-for-profit, even though we're not considered that. Um, we basically take our profits, we divide it by the number of members and each of them gets a check at the end, in addition to our artists receiving the support by way of studio space and, and materials through the cooperative. Um, to give you a sense of what our Toronto offices uh, look like, this is we were created in the, the offices down here operating as Dorset Fine Arts were created in 1976 and the board of directors at the time thought we need to have an outpost in Toronto that would allow us to be more nimble than we could be in, in the Arctic. You imagine um, travel, you imagine how, how incredibly prohibitive things are just from an expense point of view to do the kinds of stuff that we do in Toronto in terms of liaising with markets internationally. It's just not realistic to do it in, in from Cape Dorset and really remarkable that the board of directors had that vision in the 70s. Just give you a sense of what the office looks like. You can see I'm positioned where the where those uh, etching plates are. And these are all we have, we're chock a block full of artwork since the since 62 years. I think what we've retained in our archives, we have 100,000 works on paper that are in in um, permanent loan to the McMichael Payne Art Collection just outside Toronto. There are about 25,000 works in our studios in Cape Dorset. We've got about 35,000 objects here in, in Toronto. So that's a lot of stuff. And those are the things that remained with us, not the things that have moved into the world over the last 62 years. And you can see this is an example of shipping and receiving. So we, we you know, our operations here are quite sophisticated in terms of getting work from, Toronto, from Dorset to Toronto to other places in the world. I just wanted to touch on our business model and strategic planning is, is as I've discovered, is a little bit different than, than others because, again, we work so closely with the community owned by the community and the community really does 
um, insists that we maintain the connections that that uh, can we, we maintain a particular level of understanding of how things work in the community and that we we parlay that into our economic um, and business modeling and so creation connection community are the three the three pillars of our planning and obviously creation just to pref just to give you a a quick summary is the idea that we, we we focus on our artists and and one of the things that that we need to do with our artists is make sure that they have all of the provisions of materials space and and professional development so that's certainly a core tenet of of uh, of how we manage the organization connection um we understand that the only way that we are going to continue to be prosperous and 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 thus have our artists be prosperous is if we maintain our connections with the international art world. So across the country and globally, uh, we work very closely with with key markets in in uh, either re-stimulating or or um, invigorating new re-stimulating existing uh, interest or or finding new interest in in markets internationally. And then of course community. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is that we emphasize wellness in all of this. And our artists, you know, our artists are subject to the same kinds of demands that anyone else living in the Arctic. Uh, you know, childcare, um, healthcare. Uh, you know, we have we financial literacy. All of those things that that our artists need by way of you know living in the Arctic. All of the skill set that they need to to have the resources they need to have in order to be well. We're also involved in, in very very much in those discussions. And this is just, uh, I thought I would put this in there because, you know, of course, what is what is one of our biggest jobs is to cultivate um, the new generation, always. This is this is an ongoing, as you can imagine, an ongoing struggle. And um, so we are, we are, in addition to producing art and professionalization of our existing artists, we're constantly liaising with, with uh, the uh, emerging community in order to give them um, the, the confidence that making art is a viable, uh, a viable vocation and that it can be done in, in the Arctic. One minute left. And I think I, I'm under a minute. That's amazing. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, William. That was fantastic. It's a bit of a marathon, but uh, <laughs> and I'll stop this. There we go. Thanks. Thanks again. It was like an amazing overview, and I can't wait to like talk more about it with you um, and with the other panelists. So um, next we're going to have Johnny Sopachuk um, of um, Value Co-op. Johnny um, is a visual artist, curator, and community organizer living and working on the unceded Indigenous territories belonging to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples in Vancouver, British Columbia. His interdisciplinary practice explores compulsion and control through the lens of production, labor, and work. Johnny is the president of the Arts and Cultural Workers Union, um, ACWU, uh, I. ATSC Local B778 and is a founding member of two arts worker cooperatives, the Vancouver Artist Labor Union Cooperative and Stitchers Cooperative. And today, yeah, John is going to talk more about Value Co-op. So over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Karen. I'm, I'm really honored to be here and, and appreciate the invitation. So I'm just going to uh, jump right in and share my screen uh, and hopefully this uh, this works. Um, so as as uh, Karen was saying, my name is Johnny Sopachuk. Uh, I use he him pronouns and and want to start by acknowledging um, that I'm calling in from Burnaby, BC. Uh, on the unceded homelands of the Hunkaminam and Squamish speaking peoples. Um, our, our members through Value Co-op work across the Lower Mainland um, and, and we traverse uh, uh, Indigenous territories. We live and work and play here. And I think it's important when we're doing land acknowledgements that they're not just checkbox exercises that um, we center uh, where we are and center our work in uh, reconciliation and redistribution. Uh, so and that's one of a core value of uh, Value Co-op. And I'll talk about some of the, the ways we do that uh, through our work. Um, value Co-op was born about two years ago, three years ago now. It's hard to keep track of time during the pandemic um, through a series of conversations uh, uh, with arts and cultural workers. 
um, here in in the lower mainland of Vancouver. So as Karen was saying, I'm a, a visual artist uh, and curator. Um, I, I make uh, uh, sculptures and drawings uh, and um, and uh, this is one of my pieces here, uh, which is uh, a wrapping series I did around um, around action figures. Uh, so we were lucky uh, to get a, a, a grant through the BC Arts Council, which allowed us to look at uh, uh, variations of uh, collective work in the arts, whether it was through cooperatives, collectives, unions, or associations, formal and informal. And we spent a year, um, I had the opportunities to travel around North America and look at places, uh, including going to New Mexico. So it was great to hear a reference uh, earlier there uh, to Mexico and Oaxaca. Um, we looked at the Inuit uh, uh, cooperatives in uh, Northern Canada and came together and brought this initial group. Uh, there were originally four of us, we expanded to eight, and we all had a, a similar vision uh, to end exploitation of working artists uh, through our collective power. And that's, um, uh, 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 I would say we're a capital P political group. Uh, we really wanted to center individual needs uh, of the members uh, working in the cooperative, um, but also be accountable uh, to community. And, and uh, for folks who aren't uh, from the lower mainland in Vancouver, uh, some of the you know, similar issues cut across uh, uh, Canada and North America, not struggling with low wages, uh, whether working in the arts or not, uh, and, and access to space and, and flexible workspaces. So um, we, we came together, had a series of conversations, probably over a year, uh, around kitchen tables, over coffee, in galleries, where we wanted to commit to challenge exploitive labor practices within the arts, um, build new organizing models, and support existing organizing structures in the arts and uh, cultural sector. And we eventually landed on um, forming a cooperative. Uh, we, we chose not to build a nonprofit uh, because we did want to be a non-hierarchical flat uh, organizing structure. And these are just some of the principles of, of cooperative. So we formed a workers co-op. That uh, is a unionized artist cooperative uh, to create sustainable employment and support for artists and services to the community. Um, we wanted our organizing center uh, our co-op to act as an organizing hub uh, for the broader arts community, arts and cultural community here in the Lower Mainland. And we launched an artist union uh, to help develop advocacy campaigns and support artists and arts workers working at other organizations in, in Vancouver. So Value Co-op is governed by our worker owners. Um, you saw that initial founding group of eight. Uh, we ended up before formalizing, we expanded to 17 of us um, uh, for the sole reason that our initial founding group were uh, majority white. And we knew that from the start, we needed to center um, indigenous black uh, and people of color in the governance. So of our initial founding members of the 17, the majority were IPOC, um, uh, women and non-binary and queer people. So we came together, uh, all of our workers put in three shares of $250 and some of which contributed that uh, share um, as sweat equity. So through paid volunteer hours that went into the um, worker co-op, uh, our, our retained earnings fund. Uh, and we're governed by the General Assembly, which meets monthly. Our co-op's day-to-day or uh, organization is run by working groups. Uh, we have sales and orders and partnerships, production, community engagement, uh, and a board of directors. So in, the, in value, there's four different categories of, of, uh, of workers. You have worker owners, which are our core organizing team, uh, new prospective worker owners coming in uh, to full membership within the co-op, uh, collaborators, these are artists who have uh, established practices who may just want to pick up shifts or collaborate with us uh, and worker employees. And thankfully, we don't have any employees of the co-op, but the entire co-op is run by working members. Um, all of our members are paid a flat uh, living wage, 20, 
uh, 91 an hour. Uh, regardless of what work you're doing. If you're doing sales work or production work or cleaning the toilets, uh, we equally value that labor. Um, and our goal is to bring our, our general wage up to 35 an hour. So move past this idea of a living wage um, to a sustaining wage and one that sustains us, our practices, uh, our families and our communities. So, um, we also launched the Arts and Cultural Workers Union. Uh, this is our mechanism to support arts workers working um, in the broader community in Vancouver. Um, so we have helped organize five nonprofit art centers, including the Contemporary Art Gallery, Gallery Gachet, uh, Cineworks, Carfax BC, and Love Intersections, um, because we know that uh, arts nonprofits often uh, re-implement uh, corporate hierarchies. Uh, and and often the the wages uh, or the jobs are precarious and and um, and low waged. Uh, so we're successful in helping the workers at the Contemporary Art Gallery ratify their first collective agreement, which is a collective contract. And we saw some of those workers receiving a thirty percent increase um, in their wage, moving from minimum wage to over a living wage. And we're really proud of of our work through the Arts and Cultural Workers Union. So this is us uh, today. Um, uh, we have grown from our humble beginnings, uh, which was our first studio, um, which was in my living room in North Vancouver over above one of our other founding members, uh, Emily. Uh, we've grown as an organization. Um, uh, so when I talk specifically uh, about what we do as value, we're similar to the way the Arctic uh, uh, co-ops, as William was speaking about, um, uh, we're similar in that we're a social enterprise. So our members produce uh, produce collective and communal work. Uh, there's no sound on this. This is just some images from the studio where we're doing printmaking. Um, uh, we're uh, creating uh, materials, tote bags, t-shirts. We have a commercial print shop, uh, and we do projects for uh, for value-aligned organizations, other labor unions, arts organizations, uh, uh, social justice organizations, and other artists. And those projects which we do through the co-op provide uh, meaningful living wage and sustaining uh, work opportunities for our members. And then we redistribute uh, uh, the, the surplus within the cooperative and community. So we have an online store where we do uh, uh, retail um, retail projects, but then our, our primary way that that uh, we are able to sustain the cooperative and sustain uh, uh, the wages is through our, our wholesale uh, work. Um, we have grown, so we Im immediately or when we first launched, uh, we launched right at the outset of the pandemic. Uh, our public launch was uh, in, in I think it was February or March, and a couple um, weeks later, we had the pandemic closures in, in British Columbia. Um, uh, so we um, really struggled along uh, our first couple months of operations. I would even say our first year of operations as sales slumped, um, we had to contract. Uh, we we um, went to our, our primary studio, uh, but sales have, have slowly um, picked back up. Uh, uh, so we're now able, we've grown from our original 17 to about 30 active worker owners and worker collaborators uh, through the co-op. We've been able to launch some really fantastic projects uh, um, like our, our Resograph postcard pack, which uh, features uh, uh, art from a number of uh, members of value. We did it in collaboration with Emily Carr University. Um, we're so lucky to take on a really incredible project, uh, the Mao calendar, which was uh, founded by Elisa Yan, which is a celebration of arts in Chinatown, and uh, uh, the Artist Collab series, which provides uh, working artists in Vancouver the opportunity to sell and market their work on t-shirts or tote bags or stickers without having to pay huge upfront fees um, and manage a, a significant inventory. Okay, so this slide is not loading. Um, so uh, part of our work as well is also um, is a, around our mutual aid project. So as Value Co-op, we are formed as a for-profit entity, um, but we operate as a nonprofit. 
so what that means specifically is in our um, in our cooperative structure, we have written out investment shares or uh, dividends. So as William was talking about earlier, um, uh, at the end of the year, the surplus is divided uh, by members. Um, our surplus is redirected into community programs where we, um, uh, as the image says, share resources and redistribute power. And that's one of our graphics from um, one of our members, Shira Anisman. Um, so we partner with organizations like Indigenous Women Outdoors uh, to help them on a mutual aid campaign. Um, we've partnered with uh, um, Coming Together uh, Vancouver, which, which is a mutual aid group uh, that, that started at the outset of the pandemic, which we, was redistributing uh, uh, low in, or uh, accessible grants uh, and, and uh, groups like uh, the um, Nesting Doula Collective, which is a group of IDPOC, uh, um, a group of IDPOC uh, doulas uh, working on Vancouver Island, and they were raising money to help support uh, births and birthing services uh, for 25 uh, Indigenous, Black, and people of color women on Vancouver Island. So any surplus we make through the cooperative goes back into the uh, back into community organizations. And we have also been really fortunate um, to partner with an organization uh, here in our studio. Uh, and I'm, uh, two of our members, David and Jen, are going to speak about that work. Uh, the Limsai Hor Kalmok Benevolent Association, where we rent our build or rent our studio space in Chinatown. The first time I walked through this space, the doors of this space, I was 14 <laughs> in 2002. <laughs> David was a candy <laughs> raver at the time. <laughs> I was. And uh, Kat Dodds, who now lives upstairs, um, but she started Hello Cool World to do um, social justice campaigns um, and communications in the, in the community. So Value Corps in the Lim, uh, Lim Association building in Chinatown and the Benevolent Association buildings were organizations that basically brought over uh, indentured uh, Chinese laborers to work on the railroad. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a really significant history. The building is really cool too. You can see a lot of the architecture that reflects a lot of the racial history too. The building is actually two kind of like stuck together because when the original people who built this uh, building, which was the Chinese Empire Reform Society, they wanted to expand, but it was illegal for Chinese people to build past Shanghai Alley. So they just built sort of an illegal um, second building. Um, so you can actually see the division on the outside of the building. Amazing. And I didn't. I just found out this recently, Dr. Sun Yat-sen actually used to deliver his sermons, if you will, in the alley there, Amazing. just behind there. So it's such an interesting, significant history. The Lim Association was, specifically said that they wanted to support the arts and culture community mm -hmm. um, and yeah just I've known them the the board for a very long time um, and so they invited us to be in this space and we're just so excited to to do to be here it, it's so incredible to to have had that connection within our co-op and and to connect with the elders of the limb association um, so if you saw at the start of the building or the video um, we're in this downstairs space, which one of our members, Annie, is going into, um, which the Lim Association wanted to keep as, you know, accessible arts and cultural uh, space um, uh, or, or accessible space for the arts and cultural community in Vancouver. Uh, that was originally, uh, there were some developers looking at the space to turn it into a coffee shop and they said, no, we want to keep it within the arts community. So much of our mutual aid uh, uh, work is working with the Lim Association. Um, so up on the, the third floor is the Association Spaces. Uh, it's a, an organization um, that uh, the Limbs, the Sighs, the Horrors, the Cows, the Mocks have come together um, to honor those ancestries. Uh, the ancestral altar is up on the third floor and, and, and it's really been beautiful to see um, our community, you know, a bunch of young artists uh, working with an, uh, a bunch of elders um, on, on shared projects. So one of the things that our members, David and Jen, who are speaking, have taken the lead on um, is a, a mutual aid project 
uh, with the Lim Association to digitize and archive, uh, digitize their archives. Um, we were lucky to get uh, quite a number of large grants, um, which help pay our members to support them on oral history projects. Uh, we're building a website for them. We're uh, doing the, the tedious um, but incredible work of um, uh, digitizing all of their old records so that they're preserved uh, and continued on in future, um, uh, continued on and made accessible in the future for members of the association. Uh, the last project I will, will talk about is uh, our final project, which I shouldn't say our final project. There's, there's so many projects going on within the co-op, it's hard to keep up with, um, but I wanna talk really briefly about Gigi. So Gigi, um, we connected with through our, one of our mutual aid projects with Coming Together Vancouver. Um, Gigi, and I share this uh, story with permission. So Gigi is just this incredible um, uh, a sewer who was trained um, uh, through a Paris fashion uh, school and, and studied with a master tailor in San Francisco. Uh, Gigi lives here in Vancouver. Um, and she was one of the workers who was affected by, uh, uh, by the pandemic and by pandemic layoffs. Um, so Gigi here is, is sharing these beautiful masks that she was making out of her, uh, literally out of her closet in East Van after she was laid off um, because her cleaning jobs uh, were, were shut down or uh, uh, where they received layoffs um, during uh, the initial wave of, of shutdowns. Um, so we invited Gigi to work, come in, work with us within the co-op um, to help her market her masks. Uh, so those two she's holding up were the first ones I got to buy from her. And uh, uh, Gigi was originally selling her masks for $5 each. And, and we said, no way, Gigi, you need to be making a living wage. And these are premium, beautiful masks. Uh, so we invited Gigi in um, to the co-op, launched her mask making project. In the first week, sold 300 masks. In the second week, sold another 300. And then we had um, had a uh, order request for over 4,000 masks, which uh, if you do the calculations, Gigi would have been sewing uh, masks for eight months straight at 12 hours a day, uh, eight days a week. And so we, uh, uh, we collectively agreed that that wouldn't be sustainable, nor would it be ethical. Um, so through a partnership with IATSE Local 118, which is uh, a union which represents workers like Oriana, who's doing the cutting here, uh, their workers also face layoffs in the theater sector. So all of their costume shop workers um, had uh, entirely been laid off with no, um, no idea of a return to work uh, uh, because theater was so heavily impacted by the pandemic. So with Gigi and Oriana and about um, uh, 14 other workers, we launched a second sibling co-op called the Vancouver Sewing Labor Union Co-op. Um, that co-op now has grown uh, to about 20 workers uh, who are working through it. Most of our theater costume shop workers have returned to the uh, theater sector. So we've been able to invite in a new group of home-based sewer sewers who do um, the mask making GG uh, mask project around and creating tote bags uh, that one of our members, Annie, is, is modeling there uh, reluctantly, but uh, uh, we thank her for, for doing it. Um, uh, create those materials, which then are um, provided to value co-op for the large bulk orders. Um, so we are really taking an ecosystems approach to, um, to our work within value. We call it a solidarity economy. And, and, and um, uh, the goal here is to center the needs of our members uh, uh, while working within community. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Johnny, for sharing the work that Value Co-op does. It's like amazing and just wow, wow, the work that everyone is doing. Um, so now we're going to have um, about like 10, 15 minutes for the Q&A. So I'd like to invite uh, William, Janice, and Bill to also turn their video um, and mic on. Um, and I guess if there's any questions in pop that into the Q&A and, and Nathaniel will help us with that. 
Phil, go ahead. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, I see. Um, well, uh, thanks so much to, for those uh, really great projects. Uh, it's really wonderful to see. And uh, I, I had a, a question for maybe Johnny and Janice or or one of you. Um, just uh, I, I've I've done some work in in for with people with difficulty in housing and stuff like that. The people who are living close to the street in Toronto. Um, and um, uh, I just wonder, and I've met uh, through uh, my small organization that I work with called Big Pond Small Fish. I met some, like I've noticed quite a few artists living in, in these precarious situations. And um, I wonder if oh. Uh, Janice, you mentioned a little bit of work with that in uh, your projects, and I just wondered if any of you have uh, any ideas or, or any thoughts about, you know, uh, how to engage people who are sort of outside of funding, things like that uh, as well. So, yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll try first. Uh, well, it's it is what makes us human <laughs> to consider these things. So I really appreciate that question. I think that um, it, you know, so much of it is about accessibility. People have what they need to make things. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, if we consider the outsider art movement, uh, everyone could be involved in this. So it's really about um, making it a priority to connect people together and um, at, with the materials. Um, and I, it's not, I, you know, like the project that I started with, with Healthcare for the Homeless was very much driven by the people who said, you know, we know how to make art. We know where to get the materials off the street and just give us spaces to make and to show our work. And they, they did, some of them ended up, you know, on um, Canyon Road in Santa Fe. I mean, it's, people are incredible. Like everybody has the ability to create. And it's just a matter of adjusting the environment and making it a priority, in my opinion. Yeah, I, and, I, yeah and just to say that the housing piece is great, um, but in order for people to stay housed, it's important to create places where they can meet uh, because it, like housing makes us less community oriented and many people will go back to the streets because they miss having that uh, camaraderie and the people, you know, it, it's, it's really complex. So having the support for people to be housed is also very important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Johnny. No, no, I, I interrupted you there. Um, uh, I was just going to pick up on, on that um, to say, you know, our work within the co-op is, is, um, specifically uh, um, directed to early and early and mid-career artists. So emerging artists who don't benefit from the funding schemes. Um, so Value Co-op and, and the Citrus Co-op is a space where they can access work opportunities, paid work opportunities, but most importantly, flexible work opportunities. And a significant portion of our members um, live and identify openly of living with mental illness. Um, or having other barriers around housing, around transportation. So we've actually created structures to, to support those artists. So in the distribution of paid work through the co-ops, we have what's called a three-tier system. Our first tier are members who identify a need. So I, you know, I'm, I'm short on rent this month, I need to pick up 10 hours. Um, so the, our, our paid work opportunities go out to those workers first. Um, and then secondly, the, our workers are able to self-schedule. So we have a, a, a system called Airtable where workers go in and they book their own shifts. Um, so, so many traditional workplaces like a coffee shop um, or, or in restaurant, you know, the, the, um, the, the owners or managers book in the workers. Our workers do that themselves. And then they're able to um, uh, shift their uh, uh, schedules. Um, so we've seen that really help. And then with the sewing co-op, um, you know, we have centralized uh, uh, cutting at our main studio, but then our workers come home 
uh, come to the studio, they pick up the number of masks they want to create, and then they take them to their home studio. So most of our workers currently within um, the Stitchers Co-op are, are single parents, um, primarily single mothers, uh, who are able to do their, their production work at home while, while dealing with their family needs and making some um, um, pretty decent income. So I think the way we structure work uh, 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 can you know, help uh, create those spaces for artists to live and thrive. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to ask um, William about sort of the distribution process or like how the artists are remunerated, sorry, remunerated. Um, like, and, and I guess the importance of the co-op to Inuit women. So, it's, it's, to, to, to an, no, no, answering the, the second part first, I, I would say that, you know, it's dominated by female artists. It's really quite an amazing, and, and the history has been that. I mean, the early days, you think about Kunayak Ashavak, who really was, you know, groundbreaking as one of the first female artists in Canada to have the reputation that she did and inspiring. And I, I still hear from artists, and we have a, our, one of our youngest artists, and you may have seen those beautiful, um, very uh, saturated colored landscapes of icebergs in some of the videos. She's in her 20s. And I, and I said, well, you know, who, how did you begin to draw? And she says, as a child, I would be on the floor watching my great grandmother Kanoyawak draw. And so of course, this is how not one of our artists has studied classically, you know, as we would understand it in the, in the academy. I mean, it's all intergenerational. It's all, you know, and peer to peer in a lot of ways. And um, so it's interesting. I would say that, yes, the, the, the women in the community have, have very much a place in the studio and, and have a leadership place in the studio. And then of course, the, the beyond that, I mean, one of the things that, that you know, I find needs to be looked at is, you know, our, our emphasis on printmaking, drawing, and sculpture. I mean, there's also textile, there's also music, there's also other approaches that are happening in the communities and, and media arts now is of course a, a going concern. And so we're trying to, you know, discover a way, and this is, we're undertaking a strategic plan at the moment, discover a way that we can embrace other approaches in a more fluid way. And so this is, I think, coming down the pipe, and you'll hear more about that from, from the WBEC in the near future, I think. And, and to go back to, to the first part of the question, which was about remuneration. And of course, it, there's, there's often criticism, you know, amongst other amongst, you know, the, the southern community about the way that the co op um, remunerates its artists, because of course, we buy the work from the artist, you know, they come and we have buying days, it seems like to, to all of us who understand what the contemporary art scene works like in in the rest of the world, you know, in a way, um, you know, not all of the world, but other places in the world. And, you know, it, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, artists will bring their work to the co-op and we will give them a, a voucher and they will go and cash in their voucher either for, you know, uh, dollar bills or they will get supplies from the, from the cooperative um, retail store. And, you know, is it, well, well, and what then about, you know, when you when the work then sells at gallery, you know, what about a remuneration at that point for the artists? And sure, that's something that we could certainly do, you know, or something we should be think about, thinking about doing. But, but clearly what we're trying to do is create an immediate, like we're creating a salary for artists. And so weekly our artists, and some of them several thousands of dollars, you know, like Shuvanaya Shuna, for instance, who is a uh, Grishan Iskowitz prize winner at the big show at the Archive of Ontario. Shuvanaya is hugely prolific. And so Shuvanaya's primary function is to make art and Shuvanaya, you know, supports an extended family as do many of our artists. Um, the system was developed, you know, as I said, 62 years ago and, and needs to be re rethought constantly. And that's one of the questions is how do we look to some of these other systems that we could develop, perhaps like the artist resale right. That's another thing that we're, you know, we're kind of contemplating because it's an important revenue, uh, stream of revenue for, you know, any artist. And how do we then do that in, in tandem with the way that we actually provide the upfront financing and support to the artist? You know, 62 years later, it's still a work in progress. But on the other hand, I do think that, you know, the, what we do isn't necessarily broken. What we do was built at a time when we needed to be doing what we're doing. And, and we continue to, 
need to do what we're doing. But I think, you know, these kinds of conversations where I'm able to have, you know, and to discover, Johnny, what you're doing. And I think, you know, I'm already thinking of some projects and I'll be calling you and so on. You know, this, this is where we start to learn. And Janice, of course, you know, this depth of history that you were, you know, presenting and, and things that, you know, are now racing around my head, you know, so these are all important conversations. And, and I think the one thing to know about the co-op, the WBEC, is that we're, we're, always looking to improve and always looking to to develop and of course our 60th anniversary was a wake-up call around that so if that makes sense there's your long extended <laughs> thank you thank you yeah that that was another question of mine was about the resale like royalties for, for artists well, and this, i mean this is the this is the thing when you're in a situation you know when we purchase the work and then in many cases galleries purchase the work I mean, so there's, and this is where the resale right becomes complex because we're actually the second sale. So we're a secondary market sale because we, because once somebody buys it from us, you know, that's the, the second, you know, the second hands that touch that work, the second transactions happen around that work. How do you, how do we reconcile that? The expectations of what, you know, the, the co-op membership, you know, understands and, and wants and the artists understand and want versus how we do things in a different model, right? Like it's... I think there was a yeah we have a question here from lisa um william you mentioned that a number of the works are on loan to the mcmichael how is that negotiated good question that was negotiated i think i you know the a hundred thousand works is a lot of works and i would suspect that you know we had this massive archive and it becomes unruly i mean even even Yes, keeping an archive is almost a secondary thing to us. Um, so the McMichael stepped in and requested, you know, to consider uh, or, or for us to consider them as stewards of this um, of this collection. One of the things that was really interesting about uh, when I first arrived in the job eight years ago, I, I went up to the McMichael and I said, "Can you a hundred thousand works? I'll never be able to see what you know all of this inventory." So, so show me something that that um, you know you think I need to see, and there's this work that you know someone pulled out for me the curator and it was a smiley face and a little sun with those radiating little lines and i said so what why am i looking at this again and i i'm you know thinking she said this is the beginnings of mark making in the inuit you know art world and you realize like in the 19 1950s when when this was in its very early stages i mean you look at what was going on in new york it was ablaze with you know abstract expressionists and you know pop artists you know artists in the north were just learning to draw. I mean, these implements were unknown largely. I mean, there was never a written, there was really no written language to tell you the truth. And so I was, it was almost, you know, you become uh, emotional when you're looking at this and thinking this is the, the moments when, you know, pe the, these northern artists who would go on to be Kanoyak Ashavak and Kanaganak Pudagud and others, you know, were first putting pencil to paper. You know, and of course, it's it's baffling for people to understand. You know, when I explained to collectors, paper didn't exist in the Arctic, pencils didn't exist in the Arctic, printmaking certainly didn't exist in the Arctic. You know, this is all something that was imported, and and it could all have gone very badly, to tell you the truth. And it did in some communities where you know art is not necessarily the answer for everything. In Dorset, it's been the the source of prosperity, you know, since the beginning, and that's you know. I guess a testament to community ownership and and you know pride in in making and pride in expression and again in intergenerational exchange. I have a quick question that's drawn from uh, Janice's presentation, but I'm interested that everyone might have something insightful to, to share about it. Um, with art hives and co-ops benefiting communities uh, in a very tangible way on a local level, I was interested to see the map that you shared, Janice, digitally connecting art hives from all over the globe. Um, and I'm curious to hear your perspectives on the impact that globalization and these types of virtual connections might on might have on these creative collaborative models. And in considering this, have you seen any emerging trends on how art hives and art co-ops um, operate and evolve? Well, yeah, the um, the actually COVID, you know, <laughs> it's really helped us in this way. I mean, it, it closed so many, it closed all of our projects because we, we, we meet together in person. But in terms of um, reimagining, we were able very quickly uh, to be online with, with our art hives and um, we supported other art hives that went online before us, before we actually made it 
online, but that was a really good thing to do. So the learning has been extensive and in very short period of time. I think the potential is, is huge though. Suddenly at our meetings, we have people from around the world instead of um, you know, meeting in person uh, and having our, our local community, which is great too. We're doing both now, we're staying hybrid. I mean, I think that, that that's one of the trends in terms of what's next is trying to stay partially online so that we can connect as a global community um, to support each other in that cascading effect of more art hives. So the whole idea is that once uh, an art hive grows uh, big enough, uh, like too big to fit into whatever space you're in, then someone should go off and start another one in another community or in the, you know, the next neighborhood over. It's, um, yeah, I think that uh, both are so important to be able to get all the learning that will come from people from uh, in different parts of the world. Where we have now, I think, eighteen countries that we ha that has an archive. There's so much learning to be done there, and uh, we don't we don't even know what the potential is, but we know it's big. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I am realizing the time here, uh, and we are scheduled to hop over to the chats and shoes. Um, so maybe I'll just share, I'll share the link in the chat right now for everybody. So this is more of a, I don't think you'll have to register like the previous link that I shared, we'll just be able to join from here on. It's, it's probably not live yet, because I'll just start that meeting after we conclude here. So give me a few moments if anyone wants to go grab a snack or a drink and join us there in five to 10 minutes. Uh, maybe I'll just ask one more quick question here just to kind of allow people a little time to to navigate uh, that link. Um, Johnny, with so many of the uh, collaborating and partnering organizations and individuals throughout the region um, that Value Co-op's been working with, I'm wondering if you could speak to how a co-op such, such as Value Co-op might go about community outreach and engagement, uh, particularly in the early stages of development of the organization. Um, were there any notable obstacles in establishing a co-op with the structure and mandate that you have? And how do you project it might evolve in the future? I mean, all very good questions I could talk for hours on, but I, I, the thing that, that, that strikes me is, is kind of obstacles. Um, so one, you know, both, both William and Janice kind of pointed to this, the strength of the community and, and an, a cooperative model. Um, so we had, you know, 17 members who had all of these connections. Uh, we, we, we just had to look within our own community. And, you know, David had a relationship with Orville through the Limb Association. Laura had a, a relationship with Indigenous Women Outdoors. Um, so it, it was just tapping into the community. It took a lot to build a co-op. So um, our co-op cost about $150,000 to get off the ground. Um, because we opened a commercial print shop and bought a $20,000 printer with no income streams. Um, so in a traditional co-op, you know, each one of our members would have had to put in $10,000 each. And for the artists and communities we were organizing within, some of us could afford that, 99% of us couldn't. Um, so we raised money through grants, through Van City Community, um, group. Uh, we got uh, uh, purchase orders from uh, partner labor unions. Some of us maxed out our credit cards and lines of credits. Um, and, and so we, we really subverted the, the traditional model to try and create space for the artists who needed it. And, you know, it was tough at the, the start, but in the long run, I actually think it made our organization much, much stronger because the workers, the members had ownership over, um, over the organization. If we had been a nonprofit, um, I don't know that we would have survived those early days. And so value, we have a strong um, set of community-based values. We, we center all of our decisions on, on them. And so uh, uh, we've, from the get-go said, you know, we're not pursuing growth for growth sake, we're, we share our resources, we helped uh, the sewing co-op cr get created, another co-op for video uh, media artists is being spun off, um, and, and we believe in, in, you know, we believe in surplus, um, and, and by creating this structure uh, and sharing freely, I, I think it's going to create um, a system that will sustain all of us. Uh, 
it's it's tough. It's a lot of work. Um, Co-ops and collectives and and uh, working in community is not. There's no shortcuts in organizing. So um, for folks who may be thinking of this work, I think it's really uh, centering that it is a slog. Um, but in the long run, uh, it, it will make us stronger and it will sustain it us and sustain us individually when we need it. Thanks for that, Johnny, and thanks, thanks everybody for their answers and presentations today. Um, so we are going to switch over to um, Chats and Shoes, and just for a little context, uh, Chats and Shoes was a program that was initially conceived uh, as part of the Who's Chinatown virtual conference, which was presented here at Griffin, curated by Karen earlier this year. Um, so they're intended to just kind of be informal mingling sessions for community members to connect and come together. Uh, to explore the themes discussed in the previous panel over casual conversations, virtual drinks and snacks. Uh, we will be joined by Grace Law of IF Collective. Um, and again, just to remind everybody that we, we are going to be switching to that other link. So I'll, I'm going to end this meeting now and uh, I'll log on right away so people can join in, but feel free to take five minutes, go grab a snack, a drink, and we'll get started maybe, maybe around 3.20 uh, Pacific time here. So thanks again, everybody. And for those of us who might not be able to join Thank us, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye. Thanks very much.